I'm very happy that John Legg was able to be here and to introduce him. Welcome. Thank you. It is great to be here, and uh, there's two extraneous reasons. One is, is when I said yes, it didn't occur to me. This was the last week of the legislative session, so <laughs> uh, I'm catching a flight right afterwards, and uh, we'll hope to help them push across those climate change bills. The other thing is, is as hard as it is to believe, it's 20 degrees hotter in Sacramento. <laughs> They're expecting to hit 106, but they thought they could break the record of 109. So. In some ways, I'm sorry that I'm rushing back. <laughs> um, and I really enjoyed sitting through some of the presentations in the morning uh, because, it, as was intimated in the introduction, I really cut my teeth uh, on coastal issues and at the local level, uh, some of which uh, I will talk about when I sat through the atmospheric river presentation this morning. I had the misfortune on January 4th, 1982, of being in my sixth week on the Santa Cruz City Council, when an atmospheric river headed straight at us, 16 inches of rain and 36 hours in the Santa Cruz Mountains. We cheered in town when it dropped below an inch an hour uh, as it was raining, and it was unbelievable. And so, uh, having experienced it boots on the ground, it's an amazing thing. And, one of the things I wanted to mention, maybe this is as good as any, is people were sprinkling their talks with discussions of El Nino. And uh, there is, I don't know if it was happening today, but the update that comes every month is coming this week on what the uh, latest read is on El Nino heading into the uh, winter. And it's just fair to remind everybody that if it's as strong as projected, there have been seven in recorded history in California that have been at that strength. But three have been generally dry. Three have been overwhelmingly wet. One's been in the middle. And uh, the initial uh, forecast really put an emphasis on Southern California, uh, not where the reservoirs are. And there's a question about whether it's at the right temperature for snow uh, which is very important to us in the state water system. So uh, just make sure people don't stop conserving yet uh, uh, because that is really an open uh, question. Um, I was given a very broad topic, uh, which I could have done a workshop on each of these, and, and some are, to really talk about the drought and climate change and, and water. And I think I want to tie them together, and it's really convenient that you do a once every five year conference. Because I have been secretary now for four years and eight months. And if I stand back at that higher level and look at these issues, you get a sense of what has been done and what you have to do, how we frame the issues and how we respond to it. And I thought I would just start, because one of the presentations was funded in part by the Ocean Protection Council, which I chair. And one of the hardest things in taking over was we really had a menu of just doing anything we thought was good. And so the question was, is how do you focus it on some key things that are achievable tasks? And we really grouped together maybe four big ones, and a lot of things uh, fit under them. Fisheries management is a very important one, and this administration finished landing the plane on the marine protected areas. The two toughest ones of the four designations, in my view, were here, just because the size, the number of people affected. And then on the farthest northern coast, Mendocino, Humboldt, Del Norte, where there was big disagreement about the uh, uh, marine protected areas, and where there are 28 federally recognized tribes that didn't exist in other areas. And I started the administration by negotiating with the tribes to, in many ways, heal them off of the opposition and find out a way that they could work in concert with marine protected areas. And those negotiations were successful. And I think it has lessened the opposition. And we are moving into heavily the science and monitoring and enforcement and education part. And one of the stories I always like to 
tell is that for those of us that live in places where the local elected officials generally supported marine protected areas in the designation, there wasn't a lot of grassroots effort because it wasn't necessary. And yet the one place there was incredible grassroots effort was in Orange County because interestingly they did not have a strong political infrastructure in support of marine protected areas. And so when the designation happened, they were number one in sort of at the local level, grassroots, and so they're the first places to have the signs, the leaflets that you can't pass uh, a boating area or get on uh, some transportation and marine protected area without encountering education about the fact of where it is, what it exists, because that infrastructure was able to translate straight over to what we're doing when we're trying to operate them and manage them. And the very first science has started to come in. The South Central Coast was the first designated one. And the very first science is, is that they are working. Uh, but as I'm fond of saying, and I never, it, it, there was a point in my career where I probably did not know uh, about the fertility of rockfish. Uh, but um, <laughs> the fact that it is counter to what is true with humans, that they seem to be most fertile late in life, uh, you really don't know if it's working until you get to those stages in, in, in some of those species. So the question is, is are we where we are supposed to be now? And we are. But it will take going through some of those full cycles okay. to figure it out. Another of the four priorities has really been to deal with the issue of marine debris. And uh, not, one of the things is, of course, the governor signed the plastic bag still. It's been referendum. You're all going to get a chance to uphold it next year at the ballot. But we just have to be moving ahead on all those efforts. Uh, as they come. It was mentioned in uh, one of the, uh, the workshops at length about sea level rise. And when I was in the legislature, nobody was doing anything on sea level rise. And I tried this bill, uh, which was to have every local general plan incorporate sea level rise into their plannings whenever local governments updated their general plans. And I got hoisted in this weird conflict in the Senate when the bill moved over there. And that was about half the stakeholders said, uh, we don't want to support this bill unless you give us a specific baseline to plan from. And the other half of the stakeholders said, we won't support this bill if you give us a specific baseline to plan from. And I couldn't bridge that. And now, in the first months of the administration, we issued science unique to California on what the sea level rise impacts will be here. And it really worked in the issue of medians, that in 20, 50, 14 inches is the median. And if around the world we're very successful in emissions control, might be lower than that. If we're an abject failure, could be higher than that. And then you get to 2100 when you're getting into the, uh, the four or five foot range as the median. And so, uh, the fact that there was no argument over the science really allowed us then to work with local governments in really proactive ways, the Ocean Protection Council, the legislature. Uh, money has been appropriated for general plan updates for coastal communities to be able to help with sea level rise planning and incorporate it into their general planning process. But we at the agency uh, are the point people on adaptation. We issued uh, last year a five-year update and plan safeguarding California uh, on adaptation on everything, whether it's the power grid, wildlife corridors, sea level rise, uh, all the things that, that have to do. And when the governor issued his climate change executive order earlier this year, it wasn't just on the emission side. He included adaptation and formally uh, gave us further direction to move. and. We will have in state government different sectors that will report a plan out to draft in a month and workshops that will be one down here to get feedback so that we just keep pushing ahead and taking it to the next level. And the fourth thing that we're focusing on 
which was also discussed in the panel I sat in, is ocean acidification and hypoxia. And when I sort of took over as chair of the Ocean Protection Council, you know, I just kept asking, what are we doing? What are we doing? And so we actually convened a scientific panel to work on this in California. They're bit by bit moving along in their work. And that inspired Washington and Oregon, who joined with us in a pact to do it. And now people in other parts of the country are looking to us, sort of what we're doing to see how they can do it in other coastal areas. And I think the this is the perfect transition to the discussion about climate change, because it is the one of the four priorities that is really related directly to greenhouse gas emissions and uh, any failure to control them, uh, it, it discounting near coast uh, nutrients flowing in and maybe some stuff from upgrowing. It is really uh, the key uh, part of ocean acidification. And so uh, a lot of citizens don't put those two together. They don't understand that <clears throat> when they're dealing with their carbon footprint, they're dealing with uh, the acidification of the ocean. And, and that is linked. And so that is what we are trying to do with that. And then on climate change, the governor has, uh, it, and I should put in a word, ironically, in a room filled with scientists uh, for science. The, um, because I give commencement speeches all the time, and I have to tell the students, uh, I am sorry that when you deal with the general public and the media, you first have to argue for the efficacy of science, and then you release the science. Uh, uh, it would be nice if people accepted that the efficacy is there, and that should be a basis for decision making in public policy, but we are not there yet. And we are trying, for a moment on science, we are trying to really deal with that change within state government. Uh, there's someone here from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, there's multiple people here. And we are in this unique position now where we have more scientists in fish and wildlife than we have wardens because of the shift that has happened in, in how that department works with the Ocean Science Trust being with the Ocean Protection Program, we really take the science of people that are working on the coast and incorporate it and try to use it as a basis for ocean planning. In one of the most hot button issues that's going on in the state, uh, oil and all its permutations, when the Senate and the legislature passed SB4, with the toughest fracking regulations of the 50 states, I hired a science advisor and one of the things was not just to do an environmental impact report, do a science study. So when the debate goes on, the facts are on the table, people can use the facts to decide how they want to talk about it. And when you, we're doing a forest carbon study next year uh, to deal with it as a, 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 what we have to do with natural lands. And we also have Sea Grant Fellows throughout there's the science fellows in the legislature to try to create a career path so that people are involved in public policy and science and feel like there's a place that, that they can go that's not just off in a lab or doing research, that they sort of understand how public policy is made and how to engage in it. And so we're trying to create a science infrastructure as part of all of this. And if you look at the governor's goals on climate change, uh, they're very significant. They're, thank you. They're at issue right now in the legislature. If you are, uh, if you haven't talked to your assembly member yet on the various climate change bills, shame on you. There's a break right after this call. All the <laughs> let them know that's where the future of those bills is riding in the next couple of days is, is in the state assembly. But the governor has set out a goal uh, to cut petroleum use by 50%. The Pavley Bill on tailpipe standards has given us a path to where we are moving and led the nation on that. He wants to deal with short lived pollutants, and we have 8032, and there's a bill to try to extend 8032 that Fran Pavley is doing now. Um, we, uh, the governor, signed in his first year the goal into law of a renewable being the portfolio being 33% of our energy by 2020. Well, we are on track to meet that. And so his idea is to take it to 50% uh, uh, after another decade. 
uh, double the energy efficiency in buildings, and that started in his first round, and to really, and, and hopefully this is very efficient as the chili in here. Um, <laughs> but then get to natural lands, which is in my arena, because uh, I think every one of those other four has a path that we're on, it. we know. It's just extending the path and extending the goal. But when it comes to understanding the role of forests as carbon sinks or emitters and fires, that is not well understood. We are not on a clear path. Uh, and that is true with ag land preservation, which has stalled in California as well. We have some cap and trade money to try to resuscitate that notion and figure out where we're, we're going next. And, it, it, and so we are trying to do all those goals on climate change as well. And uh, uh, one of the studies that I have liked the most that came out of Stanford Woods Institute earlier this year that really plotted the temperature and what has been happening in California in the last 15 or 20 years. And this did what I think is the challenge for scientists, which is to talk in English about it. Mm -hmm. uh, one, once it's clear that in the last 10 or 15 years, we've had the hottest years in California in recorded history, that it's just a notch above what it is, they said very clearly, we're moving from a past climate in California to a future climate. And the future climate will be hotter and drier. So the question is, is since our infrastructure, whether it's water or everything else, was planned in a climate that doesn't exist in the same way anymore, how do we appropriately move the public, uh, deal with what we have to do, and deal with where we're going? Because as much as I hope all the emissions things are successful in California around the world, we are going to be having to deal with resiliency no matter how successful we are because of the change that is already happening. Which leads me to talk about the drought. And, uh, you, you know, some people want to tie specific fires or specific things to climate change. It's clear that climate change is a major factor. It's just clear. You can't talk about individual incidents in, in a clear way about it, but you sure can talk about the pattern. And if you look at what has happened in this drought, and I was talking to Mark about uh, just it's a hell of a time to be in charge of fire and water in California, and I, I, I wonder if I'd have taken the job if I had a clear understanding we were heading into the full dry season of history. Uh, but it's given us an amazing opportunity to do things that public focus that might not have happened otherwise. And the, when the drought really broke in the third year, like a year ago, January, it was amazing. It, you know, the year before, we had no recordable fires in Humboldt County in January, arguably the wettest place in California. A year ago, January, we had 473 fires in Humboldt County in January, including two that were major. Uh, major. We broke the record for the longest consecutive number of days in the middle of the rainy season without rain in Reading and Sacramento. They were in the low to mid-40s. It was 1924 and 1884. We moved into the 50s. Um, we, for the first time in history, the State Water Project, together with the Central Valley Project and the federal government, delivers water to uh, 25 million Californians and agriculture, 5 million acre feet a year on average. Last year, the allocation for the state and federal government both was 0%. You know, that it never happened. So when you have urban areas that depend on that water, it's only with what they store or other things that is getting them through this at this point. And our snowpack uh, this year, the lowest the snowpack had ever been on the April 1st measurement in the history of California, it was twice, it was at 25% of normal. This year it was at 6% of normal. Uh, the snowpack right now, as I speak, is at 0% of normal in the Sierra. And that is what we rely on uh, uh, for water in California. And when you look at fish and what happens, the federal government has just announced in the last month or two 
they'll be doing special releases into the Klamath watershed to try to keep the fish die-offs of 2001 and that period from happening again. There's no guarantee that they can, but, but that is what they're doing. If you look at the Delta, last year, see, people argue, and there's this great fracas at the federal level uh, about water, and it's very partisan that's going on right now, and it's, it's characterized as farms versus fish. And yet, if you look at the so-called environmental water in California, overwhelming majority is off the central water grid in the north coast of California and the Eel and the Trinity and the Klamath and, and those rivers. <clears throat> and there was a time last year when that 50 days of rain wasn't happening. We depend on flows through the delta, not just for fish, but for keeping the salt in the San Francisco Bay from coming in to build farms, water intakes. And there was a question about whether we could maintain salinity control in the Delta last year. Uh, when the governor did his executive order, it scaled down the system to recalibrate to where we had water availability uh, rather than release a lot of the water that we had in certain months and then not have it to save whatever we had saved in certain months later in the year. And so that is a big deal. And uh, we have really tried to balance in the right way, which leads to what do we do as a water future? And I saw the presentation by the technical advisory committee. And uh, the secretary of agriculture, EPA, and resources a year ago, January, we've been working on this for six months before the draft was breaking, issued a water action plan for California. It's 20 pages, it's readable, and it basically says, here's what we need to do to move towards sustainability in water in California. And I like the term one water, but, but ours is really all of the above. And the one thing that was missing from the one water, of course, was the most controversial one. Because one water was really how do we move off of imported water. But until we do that, we have to stabilize the imported water. And that's what we're trying to do with restoring wetlands and some stability is try to stabilize what happens with the imported water. And I was the point person for conservation when I was in the legislature. I did the 20% of the 2020 bill goals, did a bill on outdoor urban landscape irrigation that's been included in the executive order that led to a model ordinance that was opposed on any city and county that couldn't come up with their own, did an ag water measurement, did the latest generation of low flow toilets and negotiated an obscure but significant peace treaty between the pipe trades and uh, uh, plumbing interests to legalize waterless urinals in California. Um, and the thing I learned, it, it, there was a change in thinking in that time. Because when I started doing it, everybody thought, oh, conservation. That's what those enviros that you can't stand dams do to say that they're for something. And by the time it was done, I think people recognize it is a piece of the puzzle. It has to happen along with everything else, but it doesn't work unless there's some underlying reliability, because you can't conserve to nothing. You can't recycle water unless you have something reliable to do. And so that's why the all of the above strategy really relies on that, whether it's recycling, groundwater management, wetlands restoration, uh, storage, uh, fixing some of the, the long-term water projects with reliability. And the interesting thing about all that is that the water bond last year, which was very bipartisan, only two no votes in the legislature and 67% of the public, was not a traditional bond with earmarks. It was a bond that was tied to the water action plan. So there are pots for recycling. There are pots for wetlands restoration. There are pots for integrated regional watershed planning at the local level. In addition to storage, there's things to help with the new groundwater management act that was enacted. So that we really try to, across the board, incent action in all those things as the way that we're going to get there. And I thought the one water was very much in sync with that. And it really is challenging people at the local level. I had a very brief uh, governor's lobby conversation with the mayor of Los Angeles where I congratulated him on his goal with regard to imported water uh, 
cutting back and saying, you know, I'm skeptical about whether you can get there. But I was a local official that was skeptical about whether diverting 50% of our out of our landfills would ever happen, and now we're doing 60%. We're on track to cut 20% by 2020 on the water. We set the goal of 80 32 when I was in the legislature. I was like, oh my God, is that really going to happen? We're on track to talking about the next one. We thought renewables, that'll be really hard. Well, we're on track. So it is important to set the goals and then try to educate us to what you have to do uh, to actually implement them. And so maybe just to, uh, to close, the there was this great show on PBS and BBC a week ago, and I'm very uh, provincial about it, but the uh, Big Blue Live that was on for three nights, if any of you saw it, was about the Monterey Bay Area. And the interesting thing is, is they were there, and, and geez, the water is something like four and a half degrees warmer than it usually is at this time of year. So there was a reason that an excess number of whales were there, and porpoises were jumping, and, you know, and it's also the biggest of water canyon and in this west coast and has some of the best kelp fields and some of the widest array of species. But that's been at risk for 50 years, and whether it started back in the Steinbeck era with Doc Ricketts, or Margaret Owens, or those, Owens, or those of us that organized for the marine protected areas, uh, or which the state did, or organized, uh, I was a local official, and we organized for the National Marine Sanctuary. And one of the funniest things about organizing is you try to be strategic. So we advocated for the broadest boundary of the five alternatives, thinking that's a great negotiating strategy. We will draw the sanctuary bigger by advocating for the biggest size. And when they announced they were designating it and they chose the alternative we were supporting, we tried not to be surprised in public. <laughs> <laughs> because we really thought that's what we were pushing for, that's what we were trying to do. And that sanctuary, and then the overlay, of the Marine Management Act, which says you don't plan by species, you plan by ecosystems. The overlay of the marine protected areas that says we will protect certain areas based on science to try to deal with species and their health and their health over time. You put all those things together, and they were a result of an amazing amount of grassroots organizing. And then we have a worldwide show featuring that things are going okay there. And so when I look at all of you, and you're here for State of the Bay, and you're dedicated to doing this in all your different ways, that's exactly the type of activity that drives public policy, drives donations, drives investment, sets public opinion, and the, the restoration of the kelp forest that's going on here, uh, what's happened with the runoff and some of the ballot propositions, the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been, I think it's $600 million in the last 10 or 15 years between Point Conception and the Mexican border just on wetlands restoration. Uh, great things are happening, but it's just sort of having a conference like this, looking at it at the high level, getting updates on this, focusing people, getting energized and going out and making sure that elected officials will be upset if they think they're letting you down on these issues. And so uh, that's why, uh, even though it was two days before the end of session, I want to say yes to come down here because uh, these are kindred spirits in this room. And, and now that the governor has gone and met with the Pope on climate change, uh, I feel like I can officially say you guys are all doing God's work. <laughs> so thank you. Great. If there's time, I'll take questions. But I just wanted to give you an overall view of what we're trying to do at the state and how it meshes with your effort. The question is, what can we do as an audience here to make sure that, unlike in the previous four water bonds, that um, the LA region gets their fair share to really move forward on the sort of integrated water approaches that need to occur, whether it's upgrades of water recycling facilities, stormwater capture, groundwater remediation, all of those other issues have been 
you know, teed up, but to be honest, our, our region is not that good at uh, coming home with the bacon to the LA area for that kind of work. So what advice would you get? Well, first, just as an anecdote, I would tell you that <clears throat> when I was in the legislature, I was skeptical about some things that ended up in the bond because they did not benefit my home region that does not import water anyway. And I said I was very resentful that we had to pay 100% for our own water and then kick kids off health care, close schools, so that we could pay for somebody else's water on top of it. But that now is resources secretary. I strongly support that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that the thing about it is, it's a, it's a very apt question because this bond, with the exception of some geographic guidance in the integrated watershed, uh, does not have those traditional earmarks. It's merit-based and it's in those pots. So the question is, is do you tee up or work with your officials to have things that are ready to go or can be ready to go in recycling, stormwater capture, conservation, uh, the different pots that exist in the bond that then compete and qualify. And one of the things is, is this is going to be rolled out over maybe five years, seven years, so that the first appropriations that happened in the budget are the first pieces of it. So if anybody's ready, if there's been this, if Santa Monica or somewhere has this recycling project that they have just not been able to move and they had it ready, then they could apply right now it, it, there's been, this bond also required uh, endless public process. So there were meetings all over the state and regulations on how to appropriate each of the pots. So there's a public process, it's transparent, it's out there about what will be the things that help things qualify. Then it's working to make sure that there are projects locally that you can push. And so I think that's the challenge, is looking inward and seeing what they are and where are the likely places, and who would do it, and there's time, so it's not just if you're not ready right now. There will be other rounds and, and appropriated, but the sooner that people are ready, the better they're situated to actually get the bond money, and I think that's the challenge, is trying to uh, do that. 